right. Well, again, thank you for coming uh, to our program on rain gardens and rain barrels. I'm very excited about this. Um, we've done um, book talks and things like that, but it's fun to have uh, a speaker come in just like the good old days. Uh, we'll be using Zoom for a while for our programs, uh, probably through the summer, um, although uh, we are starting to think about uh, opening, um, you know, curbside pickup uh, and things like that in the near future. So uh, hopefully that'll happen soon. But in the meantime, uh, we'll enjoy our virtual program today. Um, our guest speaker is Katie Yates, a program coordinator for the Clinton River Watershed Council, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting, enhancing, and celebrating the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. Uh, Katie has been with the River the Clinton River Watershed Council since 2016 and has earned her GIS certification and bachelor's degree in environmental science and sustainability. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. And I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Sounds good. Thanks for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, on behalf of the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, we're glad that you can make this webinar. I'm excited to present. I wish I could see people's faces. We normally give presentations in person, but the circumstances are unusual right now, and so this will be just as good, I hope. Um, so I'm gonna get to it. I'm gonna share my screen. This will take just a moment for me to get it set up. And please feel free, um, if you have any questions as I run through this, I think as Phil mentioned, um, he will, you can type them in, and he will be asking them at the end on your behalf. And I'll do my best to answer. So um, I'm going to assume that uh, this is like an intro course. So if you have any, any more uh, detailed questions, feel free to ask those at the end too. Um, but here we go. This is Rain Gardens and Rain Barrels, Using Water to Your Advantage. This is what we're going to cover today. We're going to have an introduction on the Clinton River Watershed Council, um, a little bit about what we do. Then we're going to get into the rain gardens and rain barrels, examples, and finally, resources and how you can get involved in this. All right, so the Clinton River Watershed Council was established in 1972. Um, it was pretty much, it started out as a grassroots operation. Um, People didn't like that things weren't being regulated the way that they should. Uh, the Clinton River was in really bad shape. It was used as kind of like a dumping grounds. Um, you wouldn't want to fish or swim in it. Um, then the Clean Water Act passed and the Clinton River Watershed Council formed. And so things started to move and head in the right direction. And we've been going strong since. But today, we are a local nonprofit and we work to protect, enhance, and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. And there's all of our happy, happy faces. Okay, this is behind our office. This is the main branch of the Clinton River. Just a little background there. Um, we're funded through memberships, donations, and grants. We focus on education, stewardship, and watershed management, of course. So a little bit of background, what is a watershed? Some people know, some people aren't quite sure. It's an area of land where all of the water flows into the same water source. And so what that means is that usually there's a topographic divide. As you can see on your screen, the red highlight there indicates a little bit higher elevation. And I know we're in Michigan, so we don't have mountains here but the elevation around the perimeter of the watershed is slightly higher, letting gravity um, do its work and directs all the water here into the Clinton River and then into Lake St. Clair in our case. Uh, the, our watershed, here's the map of it. It's made up of five counties, um, 63 communities, 760 square miles, so it's large. It's not the largest in Michigan, but it is the most populated. We have one and a half million people here. And the Clinton River actually stretches 81.5 miles. The headwaters are in, they start around Independence Township, and then as you know, they go out to the Clinton, it goes out to Lake St. Clair, excuse me. Historical water quality problems. So 
these are the, the problems that were first being addressed when, when our organization came to form. So lack of policy and regulation, again, before the Clean Water Act, industries weren't regulated the way that they are. Um, so industrial waste, contaminated sediments, dumping, wetland loss is a big one, development, and shoreline hardening. I'm sure you guys see people that live on the lake um, or canals and they have the hardened shoreline. So that's definitely not natural. And even though it might seem nice, uh, they're not very functional nature-wise. So a lot of those problems were taken care of with the passage of the Clean Water Act. But there are current water quality problems our fecal contamination, um, I don't know if anybody goes to Lake St. Clair Metro Park. Unfortunately, the beaches there sometimes do get closed. Um, and it's, it's because of the fecal contamination. Um, contaminated sediments, so these would be legacy things. So maybe um, if an industry in the past had poor waste management practices and they had a chemical spill and it never got cleaned up. It, the chemical is attached to sediments and when it rains, those sediments get washed out to the water, um, leading to pollution. Flooding, of course. Increased temperatures in streams. This can affect trout populations if it's a cold water stream. Chemicals. Um, the main source of pollution and what we're getting after today is stormwater pollution. What is stormwater pollution? It's pretty much what it sounds like. When it rains, uh, the water runs off rooftops, roads, parking lots, driveways, any hard surface, man-made surface. Um, instead of absorbing through the ground like it should, it runs off, picks up any dirt, debris, chemical, oil, gasoline from cars, and it carries it down to our storm sewers and then eventually into our waterways. Why is it a problem? It's quality and quantity. So because the water can flow so quickly over these hard surfaces, the quantity of water accumulates quickly in our waterways. None of it's allowed to absorb or little of it is allowed to absorb, creating a quantity issue and flooding issue. And then quality issue, of course, because it picks up these contaminants along the way. So stormwater can turn a healthy river, as you can see on the left, into an unhealthy river. And we'll touch a little bit about the difference between wastewater and stormwater. Um, cities are different. Some cities have combined sewer systems, uh, which means your wastewater and stormwater go into the same drain and some have separated, where your wastewater is one drain and your stormwater is the other. In this case, if they're separate, your stormwater goes directly out to the waterways and has no treatment. So anything that goes down that drain, you can pretty much think of it as pouring it straight into the river or the lake. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. So, because our watershed has more than one and a half million people, we have lots of impervious surfaces, lots of rooftops, lots of road, roadways, driveways, um, transportation industry. So a large population combined with lots of impervious surfaces creates large amounts of stormwater runoff. So how can we manage that on our level? At the residential level, what can we do to help help this out? Rain gardens are a great way to do this. They're fun. They add value to your property, um, and they can help mitigate flooding issues. I know my parents live in Madison Heights, and their backyard is just always soggy. And they've tried tried different things um, to fix that, but a rain garden would be the best solution, in my opinion. So, what is a rain garden? To put it simply. A rain garden um, absorbs and filters the storm water. So it's going to sink it and slow it. That's the simplest way to say it. Um, letting the water sink into the ground instead of run across the cement slows it down. It lets it percolate down through the soil. And as it does that, the soil actually acts as a filter. So if it did happen to have any chemicals 
um, or any pollution in it, the soil can help filter some of that out before it makes it down into the groundwater uh, to recharge that. Here's a little bit more um, detail of the function. So intercepts and filters stormwater. Um, It'll help absorb the chemical, or the chemical reactions will take place in the soil, helping to purify the water before it makes it out to a main water source. Plants also help take up some excess nutrients like nitrogen and phosphates. Um, that's actually, it, it helps plants grow a lot where if, when you have excess nitrogen and phosphates that end up directly in the waterways, you end up with algal blooms. But if you can slow it down and run it through your garden first, it's actually, it's good for your garden and better for the, the rivers and lakes. Um, and again, it's, it releases the water more slowly. So some benefits of rain gardens. You restore the natural hydrology of the watershed. Um, reduce erosion because you don't have your soil just running away down the, down the sidewalk and into the storm drain. You reduce pollution by trapping and filtering the water. It's also great habitat for wildlife, birds, pollinators. It's, it's something that every city could use more of. You increase pervious surfaces. So instead of, um, instead of having a patio somewhere, you could have a rain garden there, um, allowing for more filtration of water and it enhances the beauty of your home. So where do you start? If you want to build a rain garden, there's a lot to think about. You might not know much about them, or you might have a neighbor that has one and you don't know what they did or where they began. So you need to decide where to put the garden, of course. Size it, create a design, choose your plants, a layout. Then you have to get to the tough work, the digging, and preparing the soil. The planting is fun in my opinion, and then the mulch, that's, that's just the, the icing on the cake. So we'll break it down here. When you think about the structure of your rain garden, think about the location, the size, and your soil type, that's important. Do you want your rain garden just anywhere? No, you definitely don't want your rain garden uh, it up to your house. You don't want to have any soggy soil at the foundation of your home, so you need to have it at least 10 feet away. Um, I'm sure you know what types of problems you can run into with, a, with water just sitting next to your house. So if you have any naturally low spots in your yard, it's a great way to, to get started. Again, it can mitigate those ongoing issues that persist. Um, a spot that has good soil infiltration is helpful, although you can you can help um, amend that with soil amendments as you construct the rain garden. You want to avoid trees. Um, I don't think tree roots would really care to be in a rain garden. The tree wouldn't. Sunny or partly sunny locations are best, but you can definitely do a shade garden. Um, it just take a little research to make sure you you choose the right plants for that that type of location. Flat or slightly sloped areas are okay. If you have a very steep hill, you might want to consider a different area. It's going to be difficult to trap the rainwater if it's running down the hill. Um, and finally, call this dig. Don't plant over utilities. Definitely don't plant over a septic system. That would, that would be detrimental to your septic system. Here's a little bit more about calculating the slope and how deep to dig your garden. So if you're on flat land, less than 4% of the slope, you can dig it about three to five inches. If you're at five to 7%, you're gonna go six to seven inches. Um, if you're very steep, again, think about a different site. It's gonna be difficult to make an effective rain garden on a steep slope. How big should the rain garden be? This has to do with the calculation. It's pretty simple. Um, it depends on the area that you're draining. So if you're draining your roof, or half of your roof, you want to do your length times width to get your area. And then you can, you can figure out 5 to 10% of that size is what your rain garden should be. So if you have a 2,000 square foot area that you're draining, your size of your rain garden should be about 200 square feet. 
And we found that the most effective size is anywhere between 70 and 300 square feet for a rain garden. Uh, what about depth? The depth is going to be about four to eight inches deep. It's going to be proportional to surface area. And sometimes it'll have to do with your soil quality as well. Um, if you're not familiar with soil types, you probably already can understand that sandy soil is going to run water through very quickly. Silt is going to be medium and clay is, is going to be very slow. Um, you can do a percolation test. I think we have a resource for this at the end. If not, I'll, I can try to get one to fill. Um, but you can do a percolation test. You can, you can do your own soil test. I don't know if anybody's ever taken a mason jar and filled it up with their soil and water and you can let it settle and then you get layers in there. You can also find ways to do that on YouTube, but you can find the layers and the clay, the silt, and the sand settle out and you're able to figure out a rough percentage of what your new soil type is um, in that way. So it's a cheap and easy, easy way to find out. Um, you want it to drain well, but you want it to hold some of the water. So you don't want it to hold water for more than one to two days. So a good mix for this, we found is 60% sand, 15% topsoil, and 25% compost. So here's a more detailed picture. Um, you have an inlet channel from the downspout, and usually we line these with stone to help direct the water. Um, you don't have to do that if you are limited on resources. Um, then you have the bowl shape, which is the shape of the rain garden itself. A little bit of a berm around the edge just to help contain the water. And then at the end, you do have an outlet because during a very extreme rain event, you need somewhere to direct the water. And this gives you control over where that excess water is being directed. Um, it's just, it's better than having a whole thing overflow. And also your plants, um, that prefer water conditions are gonna be in the center of the garden because that will uh, retain the water the longest. And the plants on the berm would be plants that prefer drier conditions. So rain garden maintenance. It's gonna be pretty simple. Um, it's like a traditional garden. There's definitely in the first couple years gonna be more weeding until the plants can establish themselves and grow large. Um, you're going to have to take a look at drainage and make sure your drainage is going well. If it's not, you can dig a relief hole in the berm to help the garden drain better. And mosquitoes should not be a problem because, again, your rain garden should be draining in one to two days. And mosquitoes take seven to ten days to mature into adults. So selecting plants. How do you select your plants? And how many do you need? There's plant space plant space populators online. Um, you're going to look at species, color, bloom time, pollinators supported, and requirements such as shade, water, and nutrients. You need plants that are going to have varying levels of water tolerance. So again, on the outside of your rain garden where it's higher and it is exposed to less water, you're going to want more drought tolerant plants. And then plants um, in the bowl of the rain garden are going to need to be the plants that like getting their feet wet, as you say. Um, also, think about how you want it to look. Do you want it to look manicured? Um, do you want it to look more wild? You can do all kinds of things with your rain garden. And something to think about, too. If you are, if the water from that's leading into your rain garden is coming from a sidewalk or from a street or a parking lot, think about salt tolerance. I know that things like cardinal flower can't handle a lot of salt. And over the course of the winter and then with the spring melt, um, as the water washes across like a parking lot or a driveway or a sidewalk, you're going to get excess inputs of salt. So you're going to need to um, choose your plant accordingly. I would really suggest using native plants. Um, if you don't already have native plants in your yard, you should get some. They're great. Once they get established, they take minimal care. 
Um, they provide habitat and food for our native species, um, and they're beautiful. So there's 40 million acres of suburban lawn in North America, if you can believe that. Um, native plant, if you can replace any of that with native plants, whether it's in a rain garden or if you decide a rain garden is not for you, if you can incorporate native plants into your regular landscaping, that's always helpful. We have some native species of butterflies and bees that are endangered and they really need the habitat. Um, also, they're adapted to the Michigan climate and soil. So again, minimal care, it's not something that you're gonna need to fertilize. Um, just low maintenance, beautiful, come, comes back every year. But also something about native plants, that they have very deep root systems. So if you look at this figure, um, I really like it. You can see in the center of the figure that the, this is a depth measurement in the center and it goes down to 16 feet. And you can see some native plants go as deep as eight or nine feet. There's some varieties where the roots go as deep as 16 feet. Or if you look at the left-hand side, the non-natives, uh, even for one of the longer rooted non-natives, they're at like three or four feet. And then the turf grass is less than a foot. Um, so the longer root systems really help grab that storm water and absorb it and slow it down, and they do a better job of holding soil in from erosion. So here's some native plant examples that would work well in a rain garden. Um, cardinal flower is the red at the top left, as I mentioned, very beautiful, not very salt, salt tolerant though, so I wouldn't recommend it if you're directing water from the street in your driveway. Lizard's tail, that's a good shade plant. Pickerel weed, excuse me, Blue lobelia, joe pie weed, swamp milkweed. I'm sure you all know milkweed is a great monarch um, plant, monarch supporter, and black willow. Again, these can attract wildlife, toads, frogs, hummingbirds, monarchs, um, bumblebees, and other bees. So we'll look at some examples. This is at our office in Rochester Hills. And if anybody is interested in seeing a rain garden in person, you should stop by the office. Um, so here's a case where you have the cement. There's a little bit of dip in the, this is like our, our parking lot area or our driveway. So there's a little bit of a, a dip here that the water's collecting. So what can you do about that? So we did a curb cut, or the city of Rochester Hills did a curb cut, and you can see, like I said, usually there's like rocks or gravel from the inlet, and then there's the cement, um, the cement spreader, it's kind of parallel um, to the garden. That helps when the water is flowing in, it helps spread it out so it's not coming in in a steady stream. Um, you can almost, use anything for a spreader. I know we were building a rain garden in Royal Oak last summer and there was an old cement, um, the thing at the end of the downspout, I don't know the word for it, kind of like a mini spreader for the downspout, but it was cement. So we flipped it over so that it didn't have the grooves, grooves facing up and kind of buried it a little bit and we used that as a spreader. So you don't have to get high tech. Um, then you can see the bowl shape of the garden. So you dig out, you dig out the soil, and then you mix in your compost and you amend your soil, like we were talking um, with the sand, the um, organic matter, and then, sorry, and then the mulch. So you mix all that in, so you have a good starting point. Um, you can see around the edges that the elevation is a little bit higher, so that's your berm around the edge. There's plants that prefer drier conditions around the edge. And in the center, we have some cardinal flower. It's hard to tell from this picture right now. It's been a few years ago, but we've got some cardinal flower. Um, we might have had some blue flag iris in there. They like the water. Um, so yeah. So today, though, that garden has taken off. Um, it, it, the native plants have just taken over. It's beautiful. 
There's almost no maintenance, just we need to go in and read it when we have time, which we don't have a lot of time, but we just need to read it. And we don't have any of the pooling issue on the cement anymore at all. And that's collected quite a bit of stormwater and just really been effective. We have a creek and the main branch of the Clinton River behind our offices as well. So anything we can do to take care of our stormwater is, is good. Okay, so this is a, a residential home. And they took water from the roof, um, directed the downspout to a little gravelly path. It doesn't look like they were able to use a spreader, but that's okay. They have a depression and also a berm around the edge. And here it is now. It's beautiful. It's very beautiful and effective, which is even better. And they have a nice plan. Okay, so this is in Royal Oak on 4th Street. And this is another one that's directing water from the road. Um, you can see where the gravelly areas are. There's been a curb cut to direct water into the depression. And it's shaped kind of like a swale. So the center is, is a deeper trench. And the perimeter, the edges are raised a little bit higher um, to help keep the stormwater in the middle. And then there's an outlet down at the end. Okay, this is Depot Park in Clarkson. Again, you can see where the water has made its own path from, from the cement um, down to wherever the lowest point is. So gravity does its work. The water goes the way that gravi gravity directs it. Um, and that's a great, a great location to put a rain garden in because the water's already going there. You don't have to fight with anything. It's going to capture the runoff from the road. And this is the rain garden today. This is a little bit more of a wild look. These are natives, um, some native grasses, some native flowers. Um, I, the examples before were, were more manicured. So again, it's your preference. I think this would be very friendly to pollinators, the way that they have this set up here. This is at Rochester Hills Museum. Um, if anybody gets the chance to go here, this is a beautiful area. There's a, a historic farm, a museum, and Stony Creek runs behind here, and that is consistently gives us some of the most diverse macroinvertebrates when we sample there, meaning that it's got very clean water. It's very nice. Um, but they, they did a rain garden here. So this captures water off the road again. And this is uh, at the University of Wisconsin. So this is on a very large scale. Um, but they've got water coming from the building and then also from the parking lots. Um, if anybody has questions about the rain gardens, again, feel free to type them out to Phil and we'll go over them at the end. I'll be happy to do so. Um, but what if you don't have the space for a rain garden or maybe your, your property is on a hill or maybe you don't want one? <laughs> there's alternatives and there's other ways to capture storm water. Um, that are also good. So we'll talk about it. Rain barrels. So they're going to capture storm water from a downspout. They can be used to wash your car. It could be used to water a vegetable garden if you wanted. Um, pretty much anything you can think of. It will save you on your water utility bill. It will reduce runoff from your roof. Um, and a rain barrel can be very simple or they have some very fancy versions. You can make your own. It's however you want it to be. But you need to think about some things such as having a removable top, um, what to do about overflow, elevation so that you can get water to flow out of the rain barrel when you need it, um, a screen to keep out debris, and mosquitoes because unlike rain gardens, rain barrels are meant to retain water definitely for more than one or two days. Here's a very simple rain barrel design. I like this because I hadn't seen this before. Um, they suggest, we have, let me start with this. You start with a gutter, 
going into the top, there's a screen at the input. Um, the water is collected in the rain barrel, and at the very bottom, there's an outlet. So that is like the simplest version. But they suggested using a clear hose at the bottom, and you can attach it at the top with like a clip or, or in some way. And that way you can see uh, the water level through the clear plastic hose, which I think is a really cool idea because that's one thing is you, without taking the lid off or looking in there, um, you can't really tell how much rain is in the room there. And then you would simply undo the hose and, and drop it down to get your water. So that's a very simple design. Here is a little bit more complicated. It's still not difficult and can be done for you know not too much money because they're utilizing the trash can. Um, but essentially you have your bounce spout, you have your inlet, you have at the top an overflow hose, which I did not see on the last picture. Um, this way you can direct where the overflow goes instead of just having it all spill out over the top. So it just takes a couple sheet, um, sheet metal screws, um, conduit hangers, and then at the bottom you have your spigot, ventilation holes, I forgot to mention that. So what about mosquitoes? How can you stop mosquitoes from getting in there? The craziest thing that I've heard, which I've not tried, but I have to, I have to suggest it, is putting a goldfish in there. I don't know if it's humane or maybe you would take it in over the winter, but I've read that they love mosquito larvae, like we love chocolate, and that they will eat the larvae and then their waste adds um, nitrogen to the water. So if you then use it to water your plants, they're getting some fertilizer. So in theory, it sounds great, but I've not put it into practice, so I don't know. Another option, a more, a more mainstream option, is a screen or a filter over the top. Now this does come with some maintenance. Just think of your gutters. When it rains, you get leaves and helicopters in there and other debris, and they need to be cleaned out. These screens will need to be maintained as well. So you can't just forget about your rain barrel. You do have to take care of it and make sure that it's not getting clogged up with debris. Um, and then mosquito dunks. Again, I've not used mosquito dunks, um, but I guess you put them in the rain barrel and they kill mosquito larvae and you can find them at the hardware store. Here's some examples of rain barrels. This is a very fancy rain barrel. Um, you can buy it and there are some rain barrels here that are examples people made. Um, you can even double up your rain barrels if you have a very large roof and you have a lot of storm water that you need to collect or you want to divert all the water from your roof into one area. You can do two, three, four rain barrels um, connected to each other and collect all of that water at once. So improving water quality is also our responsibility on an individual level, at a homeowner level. Um, it may seem like it's not making that big of a difference, but every little bit does count. Um, and making the effort in educating your peers and your neighbors on things that you've learned regarding stormwater and pollution and the environment is also doing your part. So how else can you get involved? If you maybe you live in an apartment, maybe rain barrels or rain gardens aren't up your alley, you can volunteer um, either with us or another organization. We have citizen science what volunteer opportunities such as adopt a stream where you monitor streams you get free training um, you could participate in a cleanup we do weekly cleanups across the watershed at different locations we also have other cleanup times um, such as clinton cleanup which is it's on a saturday in september and we get different groups out across the watershed for maximum impact so we've collected thousands of pounds of trash because of the help of people like you. Um, we have other events like the native plant sale that's coming up. I don't know if the plants are sold out. If anybody wants to buy native plants, if you go to um, plantsforecology.com, 
he is a local native plant salesman or uh, nursery and that's who we work with to get our native plants but he does a lot he donates a lot of his profits to people like us crwc and other um and other places as well so i would hop on his website and see if you're interested see if he's got anything else available um, you could also become a member of the Clinton River Watershed. Again, donations are what keep us going. Um, grants are what keep us going. People keep us going. So we appreciate any support that we can get. Here's your plant resources. And I believe that this will be shared with everybody. Um, if you have any questions after this, you can feel free to email me anytime. Um, my email is katie, K-A-T-I-E, at crwc.org. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions or provide more detailed information um, that anybody would need. Here's Rain Garden Resources. And that is it for us today. So I'm going to take it out of screen sharing mode. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. Um, if anyone has a question, um, feel free to use the chat or Q&A feature uh, at the bottom. Um, and uh, I have I have one question. Um, mm -hmm. We have standing water a lot at our house in Huntington Woods, and we called the local municipality, and they mentioned a rain garden or a rain barrel. Um, so um, a lot of the runoff comes from our garage roof, and that would be a uh, an easy place for us to collect rainwater. Once that barrel's full, <laughs> what do we do with that water? Do we just let out a little trickle at a time when, when the weather's warmer? Is that, is that all there is to it? You could do that. Hopefully you have some native plants you could water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you have a vegetable garden at all? We don't, uh, but we, we realize we probably need to use that space for some sort of uh, okay. garden. Even like annuals. I know if you buy any annuals, they need to be watered a lot. Um, you could also use it to wash your car. I know you're not going to wash your car every week. Um, but if you're not able to use the water, yeah, letting it trickle out slowly is best because, like we said in the presentation, um, slowing water down and capturing water really gives it time to get filtered before it recharges the groundwater or makes it out to a water source. So, yes. Great. Thank you. Well, well, other people, I'll give other people a chance to type their questions if they have any. In the meantime, I, I'm going to give my plug. Uh, if you're free next Wednesday, Backyard Birding uh, will be uh, presented by Bob and Pam Gores of Wild Birds Unlimited. That'll be next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Um, you can sign up for that uh, using uh, our events calendar uh, at our website, cmpl.org. Or you can just email me with your with your name and library card number. Everyone should have gotten an email from me today. Um, and, um, and then I can sign you up for that if you're interested. Um, for those of you who are interested um, in today's program, we are recording it. And uh, hopefully we'll put it on YouTube at, at least and, and maybe on Facebook again. And then, um, Katie, are you okay with me converting your presentation to a PDF to share with people who are interested? Because you had a lot of good links there. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, looks like we do have some questions. Um, uh, first question I see is, uh, where do you find parts to make your own barrel? Very good question. Um, the hardware store, Home Depot, um, Aco. So one of... I think there's a link on the second example of rain, bar or rain barrel construction that I have. There's a very tiny link, and it's in green. Um, there was a link to an article that breaks down every piece that you would need. So some things you'll need, you could use one of, you could, you could buy a trash can. Um, if you have access to a large barrel, I don't remember what industries use the large barrels. Um, but sometimes you can you can call around and ask for that. But let's say you start out with a trash can, and then you'll need some uh, plumbing supplies. Again, that's right at the hardware store, like a spigot, and then probably we'll need some washers and things like that to help seal the water off. 
But I will make sure that that link is in the presentation, which I'm pretty sure because I put it there this morning. Um, but click on that link, and it'll take you to an article that'll that'll break everything down with what you need. So you can just take the list to the store, pretty much. Cool, and I'll make sure everyone gets uh, gets that file. Um, I have another question. Uh, I had someone comment about my rain barrel being illegal. Is that true? It could be. Um, if you live somewhere that has like a neighborhood association, um, associations have different rules. So I'm not part of one, and I've never been a part of one, but I have heard that some associations, you know, they have specifications on what types of plants you can plant or what types of fences you can have. I would one, check with your association and see if they're okay with it, if you're in one. If you're not, you could have an ordinance from your city saying that they're not okay with rain barrels. Um, you could call your city. Maybe if they're not okay, maybe they don't want it on the ground, and maybe there's something specific about a rain barrel that they're, it's for some reason is against the ordinances, but I would, yes, start with, um, start with that, asking those questions. Thanks. Um, this question is, uh, if you have other plants in your yard, can one use non-native plants in a rain garden, or are their roots not quite right? You can, as long as they're okay with um, being exposed to a lot of water. So yeah, any plants can be used in a rain garden. Um, and again, it has to do with how much water exposure that they can tolerate. Of course, we push native plants, but I understand if you have some plants in your yard that you can divide up and, um, you know, at a, a nice, low cost, easy, easy access, go for it. Any rain garden is better than, than none, and plants are still good. Even though we like native plants better, plants are still good, and so yes, definitely. All right. Um, this question is, uh, are there diverters that will automatically switch over from a full rain barrel and put the water back into the downspout? Well, you should, I hope I'm understanding this question right. You should have an overflow outlet um, at the top area of your rain barrel before it would go back into the downspout. Did I understand that right? Um, I'll let um, I'll let the questioner uh, clarify if uh, if she needs to. Uh, oh, she seems satisfied with your answer. So okay, so okay, so if you go back um, again when you get access to the presentation again, if you go back to a couple of the slides that have the how to like the construction that are, it's the drawing of the rain barrel, the second picture shows where there's like an outlet hose at the top, and then that way. Um, so you have a 100-year rain event where you have just gobs of water coming down and it is too much for your rain barrel because you didn't get to drain it out recently or you didn't water anything recently. That outlet will just um, let any of the overflow be dispersed instead of go back into your downspout. Great. Thank you. All right, let me just make sure that there's nothing in the Q&A section. Looks like that's all we've got. Well, we really appreciate your help uh, uh, today and presenting today, Katie. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm very excited to get started. Um, let's see, guys. Uh, oh, thank you. I got a, uh, another thank you uh, from uh, one of our attendees. Um, so great, yeah. We'll we'll um, uh, we'll post this on YouTube at minimum in case you need to review it, and then this afternoon um, I'll convert this to a PDF and share with everybody that attended today. And, and thank you all so much for attending today. This is exciting. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.